Mr. Babcock, how are hey, you, what's sir? Up? What's up, my brother? I'm just starting to be able to uh, breathe correctly. I was in I was in Vail this past weekend. And I you feel you like that. you're sucking on a helium balloon for three days? Dude, <laughs> I come from a state that's a pancake. I mean, well, I shouldn't say I come from a state, but I live in a state that's a pancake. So yeah. when you go, hey, I got a couple of shots we can show you. So when I go up to these mountains here, you know, it's uh, it's a little rough for me. You know, I think I, this is what I think of when I go to the mountains. I'm like, you know, like, that's, that's what I feel like. I, I don't feel like this. So, that's yeah, you're looking a little for different. Noah's Ark up on Everest or something. Oh man, it's brutal. I don't know if you ever gone to any mountains at all, but it's uh, it takes a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. At altitude. But then again, you know, like you said, your your elevation is what 300 feet above sea water, sea level. I, I, I believe the highest point in Florida is 300, 300 feet. Above so you sea. guys just kind of like walk around with you know life vests on all the time. <laughs> we're not Louisiana, but yes. <laughs> so, but um, I've been looking forward to this episode for quite some time. Yeah, you? I know you have. Oh, yeah, I know you have. I know this is going to be a fun one tonight. We were lucky enough that uh, our, our previous guest and our friend Robert Bruzio uh, made the introduction, and um, we've been waiting for this for a while. We had some hiccups on everybody's end, and I knew it would happen eventually, but he, you know, I, I couldn't wait for it to really get going. Um, so oh, usually yeah. when we do have somebody like this, uh, we don't sit here and chat as long as we normally do. We bring them on because, oh, yeah. you know, they want to talk to them, not us. So. Yeah, I mean, the appetizers run out in the green room after a while, so. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. He's done eating. He wants to come out here. So, so let us introduce the uh, a very, very uh, established producer, Mr. Bill Chartoff. Bill, how are you, sir? Hello, oh, gentlemen. Hi, it's Again, Thank, you. thank Hi. you so much for coming on. We appreciate it. I know you're a busy man. It's uh, I'm not that busy. Not busy. <laughs> <laughs> you can pretend I live a busy be. life of the, the Hollywood producer, but the truth is uh, I, I spent most of my morning cleaning up tree tree trimmings from my yard. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> let's not let's not uh, over romanticize it. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. But thank same. you for having me, and thank you for inviting me, and thanks oh, to Robert God. Buzio for. We've been looking forward to this. It's a pleasure. Yes, to absolutely. Here. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, anybody that uh, is a Rocky fan and has followed the Rocky world of movies uh, knows that Bill's dad, Mr. Robert Chardoff, uh, produced Rocky, uh, or the Rocky movies, I should say, not just Rocky, but won the best picture for Rocky. Uh, and uh, and I guess, Bill, just to get right at it, I mean, you, you grew up around Rocky. I mean, Rocky was uh, a day to day thing with you. I grew up, I mean, I grew up with my father working in the film business. I mean, uh, originally he, uh, he started as a, um, as a personal manager. Okay. Um, he had a, uh, an uncle, um, who worked in the Catskill mountains. His name was, was Charlie Rapp and Charlie, uh, Charlie had a, a pretty good gig going. He, um, uh, he he would book all the all the acts, all the singers, all the comedians mm -hmm. for the Catskill Mountain uh, resorts, and uh, and he also managed the actors, or rather the comedians and the musicians. So he 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 booked his own talent. Into, <laughs> <laughs> so he, he had a great gig going. Yeah, uh, really. And, and Charlie was uh, he was known as known as the king of the Catskills, uh, Charlie. Kind of like um, dirty dancing, right? I was, I was waiting to say that, Tony. <laughs> exactly. It's that era. Uh, yeah. Danny Kravitz and, uh, I mean, it has been documented in, in several yeah. wonderful feature films that period. Awesome. Um, but he didn't he didn't really know my father that well. He, he was, um, uh, what happened was, is my father was very close with his sister. Okay. And my father uh, was, uh, would work during the summers to um, to pay for his uh, his his college education, his father was a who I was named after was a musician. He played um, bass with the New York Philharmonic, but he didn't make such a great living. And so my father Bob, um, in order to pay for his his college, would 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 work as a waiter in the Catskill Mountains in the summers. 
And uh, at one point, uh, uh, my father's aunt said to her brother, she said, you know, your, your, your nephew, Bob, works up in the Catskills um, as a waiter. And why don't you go see him one day, you know, be, be a nice guy. And, um, and one day, m my father was, uh, it was in between lunch and dinner. And he got a, um, uh, he was resting. Uh, all of the, the waiters would sleep in these kind of dormitories that they would have. Yeah. And uh, oh. one of the guys came to him and said, hey, Bobby, your, your uncle's up in the coffee shop. He wants you to come up and see him. And uh, so he went up and uh, Charlie was sitting in a booth. Uh, and, um, and my father walked up to the booth and he said, uh, Charlie, I'm your, your nephew, Bob. And Charlie looked at him and said, you look like crap. Sit down. <laughs> <laughs> and so how do you do? <laughs> I know, right? sat down and they chatted for a while. And, um, and Charlie said to him, listen, next, next summer, don't do this. Come and work for me. Um, and so uh, thereafter, he began uh, working with Charlie, driving him around and, um, and learning the business, really, by, you know, being Charlie's right-hand man. And uh, eventually, uh, he, started, uh, he started helping Charlie manage all the acts and... Um, and eventually he graduated from law school and started studying law, but, um, uh, but he, he really hated law. Uh, he, he'd only become a lawyer to, uh, to mollify his mother and father, um, okay. who, who, you know, both of them were in utter dismay when he had dropped out of medical school. So he, he went to law school and, uh, and so he finished, uh, he finished uh, at Columbia Law School. He passed the bar. He started working as a lawyer and, and he hated it. So he went back to work for Charlie. And that's really how he got into the entertainment business and how he met Erwin Winkler, his eventual partner. Okay. Wow. Um, he worked for Charlie, uh, managing people like, um, uh, you know, I mean, just all the great comedians and singers. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, and, and eventually he convinced Erwin uh, to uh, Irwin was working at uh, at the William Morris Agency, okay, and uh, and he convinced Irwin to come in as a partner with him, and the two of them started managing uh, different acts. They managed, uh, uh, you know, uh, people like Joni Mitchell mm -hmm. and um, Crosby, Stills and Nash, oh, wow. and uh, a lot of the the great musicians of the time, wow. and um, and also many of the wonderful comedians back then. And that's really how he got into the entertainment business. And that it was around that time that I was born and we were living in New York. Um, and, uh, and eventually uh, he got, he and Irwin got an opportunity to, to make a film, um, uh, which uh, I mean, if you want, I can tell you the story. It's a, uh, they, were, they were managing uh, Julie Christie was one of their clients. And um <clears throat> And they got a call one day, that's my dog barking, uh, they got a call one day from the head of production at, um, at MGM. And uh, Julie Christie was, at that time, she was, I think, uh, uh, starring in, um, it was either Darling or Dr. Zhivago. Okay. And, uh, and he, said, he said to them, listen, guys, we, we'd like your client, Julie, to... Uh, um, uh, to be in our next film. Do you think that you could arrange it? And they said, uh, sure. Uh, and she was shooting in Europe. So they flew to Europe and they convinced her to do the film and they came back to New York and they, they told the head of production uh, that, um, that she had agreed to do the film. And he was very, very pleased, pleased about this. And uh, he asked them to come in and they, they met him and he said to them, um, guys, if you ever have an idea for a movie, uh, let, me, let me know. So two days later, they called him up and they said, listen, we got an idea for a movie. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and they sent him a script on Friday and they said to him specifically, they said, because they knew they could get her. They said, we think that this would be a great, great film for Julie Christie. Um, and she was a big star at the time. Yeah, yeah. He said, great, I'll read it over the weekend. 
Uh, he took it home and he called them on Monday and he said, so boys, I read your script over the weekend and I think it's a good script, uh, but it doesn't feel right uh, for Julie Christie. And they were immediately disappointed. Um, he said, but, but I have another idea. Um, and they said, sure, what's the idea? And he said, Elvis Presley. Um, <laughs> and, uh, Elvis Presley was, was even bigger than Julie Christie. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and so that was the first film that Bob and Irwin were, um, were involved in. It was a film called Double Trouble with, uh, oh, yeah, um, Double Trouble. with Elvis Presley. And that really started their film careers. Um, not that they made that film and not long after they put together another film uh, which was called Point Blank with Lee Marvin. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a, an action film. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's considered something of a classic. And it was very successful. And from that point on, their, their careers as, as movie producers really took off. And they just made one film after the other. Wow. wow. That's... And yeah. So it, they, they were very, very fortunate. I mean, as my father said, you know, it's very different than today. Um, back then one guy could green light a movie. They knew yeah. the head of production, mm -hmm. he liked them. Yeah. Uh, and if he said the film was a go, it was a go. Um, whereas today it's, uh, it's much more corporate and, sure. um, okay. and a, lot more, you know, a lot more people are involved in these decisions. Um, but back then uh, it was, things could, were streamlined and they could, they could get things oh, sure. done. Much back more. then they even had handshake deals. I mean, they, it was a different right. world back then. That's different right. World. That's right. I mean, another wonderful story my father told me about getting Point Blank made was that um, they had, you know, they um, they they became from familiar with a, a director named John Borman, um, who uh, who made Deliverance and uh, and many other great films, and ended up turned out to, to be one yeah. of my father's great friends for the for much of his life. Um, they became very very close, and John was a John is a wonderful director. Um, but he wasn't well known then. He had only made one film called Hell in the Pacific. Um, uh, and it was with Lee that. Marvin. And um, and so they went in. They were a little worried that MGM would not approve John as the as the director. So they went in um, to a meeting and it was the head of production. And he had all his henchmen sitting on the side. <laughs> and uh, the uh, the head of production said to him, so, you know, we read Point Blank. It's a good script. Um, who, who's gonna, who's gonna play the lead in this movie? And they said, well, we've, we've managed to secure uh, Lee Marvin. And he said, ah, Lee Marvin, wow, fantastic. Love Lee Marvin, tough guy, love him. Who's, uh, who's gonna play the girl in the movie? He said, he said they said, well, we've, uh, we've, uh, we've got uh, Angie Dickinson to star as the, he said, wow, Angie Dickinson, Lee Marvin, wow, what a couple, oh, this is fantastic. And um, he said, this sounds great. Sounds like we're gonna make this movie. Um, one, one other question, um, who, who's gonna direct this, this <laughs> oh, movie? <no. laughs> this was the, the question they'd been dreading. And just as he asked the question, the phone rang. And, uh, and he said, one minute guys, one minute. And he picked up the phone and there was a problem on one of his productions. And they all sat there in the room for about 15 minutes while he dealt with the, um, the problem. He hung up the phone. And he said, uh, so, uh, point blank, Lee Marvin, Angie Dickinson. Okay, let's make this movie. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Completely forgot to ask about oh the director. Oh, my God. That's so funny. Yeah. Saved by the bell. And, yeah. 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 <laughs> and so, so they made a series of, of films thereafter. Uh, they made uh, a, a film... Uh, uh, um, Let's see. They they made um, they shoot horses, don't they? Oh yeah, um, which was a, an Oscar winner and a and a very successful film. Um, they made a series of of good films and also some some really bad films. Yeah, um, they, you know, uh, some of them worked, some of them didn't. Um, but of course, it all changed when when Rocky got made. Oh yeah, and um, they had um, uh, they had just signed Bob and Irwin had just signed a. Uh, a deal with it with MGM United Artists. Um, it was a, a first look deal, and it was one of the first first look deals that any producers had at the time. 
Um, and basically what that meant is that any film that they wanted to make, uh, they, uh, they had to bring it to, uh, to MGM first. Okay. Um, and if MGM wanted to make it, uh, they had the first, first right to make it. And they, they promised to make uh, two films a year from uh, Chardoff Winkler. Okay. And um, uh, and actually, the first script that they brought them was Rocky, um, which, uh, as you as you know, as Hollywood lore, yeah, uh, you know that they they were not that enthusiastic about it. Yeah, right. Um, they uh, they didn't know who Sylvester Stallone was, mm -hmm. and uh, and it seemed like uh, you know it wasn't really what they were what they were expecting to get out of them. Um, but, uh, but Bob and Irwin were very, um, very enthusiastic about it and they pushed them hard to make it. Um, and there's a, there's a, a very good story that I don't know if anyone is on this podcast has, has talked about this story, but, um, but even, even Sly has confirmed it to me, um, that, uh, that, you know, uh, back then United Artists, uh, we're all back in New York. Okay. Um, and, you know, the MGM, they, they're two companies, MGM UA, and they mm -hmm. ran sort of autonomously. United Artists had come up, uh, it was a creation of Charlie Chaplin and Mary Pickford oh. um, uh, originally. Um, that's how the company had begun. And the idea behind United Artists was that you would let the artists make the movie, <clears throat> um, you wouldn't interfere. You wouldn't uh, get in their way. You would you would leave them to to do their work um, once you had agreed to make it. Um, so they uh, they had proposed this uh, to to UA. Uh, UA was not as was as I said was not so enthusiastic about it. Um, uh, but they you know they Bob and Irwin sent them a a film called The Lords of Flatbush. Oh yeah. Which, which Sly was in, and Sly had a, a leading. He wasn't the lead in it, but he had a, he had a big role in the film. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, and so they wanted to know who Sylvester Stallone was. So they they sent a print back then. You know, there was nothing was digital. They sent a they sent a gigantic print back to New York for them, and all the guys from UA got together in the screening room, and uh, and they sit down and they start screening the Lords of Flatbush. And uh, the lead of the film was a guy named Perry King. Perry King, yeah. And Perry King's a, a good-looking, blonde-haired yep. guy. And so they start watching the movie. And, um, and, uh, and at some point, one of the heads of UA shouts out, which one is Stallone? And uh, Perry King was on the screen. And somebody said, it must be him. And then another voice said, that can't be Stallone. Stallone's an Italian name. This guy's got blonde hair and blue eyes. And then another voice said, maybe he's Northern Italian. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. So they really liked Perry King a lot in the film. <laughs> oh, they agreed to make Rocky That's with fine. Sylvester Stallone. Oh, man. And, um, and so, but, uh, but as you, you know, uh, they agreed to make the film. They agreed to put in no more than a million dollars for the film. And they told Bob and Irwin that if they went over at all, that they were responsible for what any overages right. on the film. And um, uh, here, I'm just moving because the light is a little bit funny. No, you're but, good. Um, you're fine. Yeah. But uh, so they went off and they made the film and, uh, and they put together an edit and uh, they sent it back to New York. Um, and of course, it, being United Artists, nobody bothered them. Nobody came to the set. Nobody, you know, there was no uh, interference. And so all the guys from UA got together to see the first cut of Rocky uh, in the UA screening room in New York. And they sat down. And this was a, a kind of a rough cut of the film. And, uh, and they start watching it. And uh, Sly comes on, and the movie's one minute in, two minutes in, five minutes in. And at some point, one of them says, where's Stallone? <laughs> 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 so 
but they they watched the film and they loved it. Yeah. And uh, the film it cost one point two million or something like that. And so Bob and Irwin were on the hook for two hundred thousand, which was back then was, was money. And oh yeah. And it is too, but back then it was really money. I, if I recall, you I remember hearing the rumors or or it might have been just the fact that your dad had your dad and Erwin they had to like put up their houses. It's correct. Yeah, it's absolutely um, true. They had wow. put up their houses as, as collateral for any overages. Right, right. And um, and so they get a phone call after they watched it from the head of UA. Um, his name was Arthur Krim, and. Uh, and he said to them, listen, guys, we watched Rocky. And the first thing I'll tell you is, you know, that two hundred thousand dollars that you went over on the film? He said, don't worry about it. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> and yeah. then they, he said, I predict that Rocky will make ten million dollars at the box office. Damn. Um, we think it's great. We love it. And I think it's going to do just be a absolute smash and make a hundred million dollars at the box office. Wow. And of course, when it came out, it made a hundred million, uh, yeah, a hundred million where there's Crazy. about in, the, in its initial box office release. So, yeah. so that's, that's really, um, you know, what got them started on Rocky. Um, and you know, it's, uh, it all went on from there. Sure. Um, there, there are a couple of things that you might look for next time you watch the film. Okay. Uh, if you remember, uh, there's a there's a scene where Rocky is called into the manager's office. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they he he doesn't realize it. He thinks he's coming in to be a sparring partner. Oh yeah, yeah, yes. Right. yes. But the idea is that um, uh, that they actually want him to to fight Apollo Creed, mm -hmm. and he comes in and, and he walks into the office and he walks up to a there's a secretary uh, there. And uh, and sitting on the secretary's desk is a photograph of a boy with a sailor's hat on, like a captain's hat on, and that's actually me. <laughs> oh no! Uh, oh my God! That's that is awesome. Awesome. There's a scene in the film where uh, he's walking down the street in Philadelphia late at night, um, and uh, he passes two kids on the street, and they go, "Hey, Rock, you're Rocky." Yeah, yeah. To him. And that's yeah. those. That's not my sister and I, but it's our voices. Oh, uh, oh really? We were there, well, they were doing the ADR, and they needed the voices of the two kids, and we were there with my father. Yeah. So we recorded. Uh, my sister and I recorded uh, the oh voices. Hey, Rock, you're Rocky, and so we're uh, we're forever uh, memorialized in yeah, exactly those two scenes in the film. That's awesome. And, um, and another story. I'm not giving you guys any chance to talk, and I hope it's uh, there, there's oh. a. There's a reason. There's a reason why this is happening. Nobody wants to hear us talk. Trust yeah. me. You want, hear, you want to hear your stories? We want to hear your stories. Yeah, I'm yeah. trying to get around this here. sunlight, but uh, here, let's see if that's any better. I wanted to know what that boxing picture was on your wall. Well, this is actually what. Oh, well, I got a couple of things. This thing back here is actually a really cool Rocky poster. Um, oh, I've seen. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen this one. It was uh, from a screening they did in 2010. Oh, my okay. God, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, it's got the steps. Uh, nice. Yeah, on the steps in Philly. I love that, yeah. yeah. And uh, Oh, and here's a, a poster from Point Blank. Okay. Nice. I love the 70s posters. Yeah. They were yeah. So this, is, this is just a photo from Raging Bull. Okay. Raging Bull. That's, uh, yeah. I couldn't really see it. But I was interested wow. in it. Wow. So, you know, what, oh, here, we want to hear all the Rocky stories you have. Bill. I mean, right, well, I, what, another one I'll tell you is the first time I saw the film um, uh, was with uh, it was my sis, my younger sister and I. Uh, we went with my father and John Avildsen. I was, I guess, about 13. OK. My younger sister was probably 11 or 12. And we went uh, down into the screening room at MGM, which was uh, in, in the basement um, they had some screening rooms. And so we went down there and uh, it was just the four of us watching the movie. And, uh, and that was the first time I saw it. And I remember we really enjoyed it. And, uh, we were with, uh, Bob and John Avildsen and, and at the, after the, after we were done, we, we stayed in the screening room and Bob and John started talking about, apparently they were contemplating cutting out the scene with little Marie. 
Um, okay. The feeling was that it didn't advance the plot in any way. Um, and I guess they were looking to shorten the film a little bit. And I remember that my sister and I said to them, you cannot cut out that scene. That makes you love Rocky. Yep. Feel compassion and sympathy for him. Mm -hmm. and, wow. and we do not, and my sister and I both talked them into, uh, into not cutting out that scene. Well, I mean, you guys were right. Like you're absolutely right. It doesn't further yeah. the plot line. It doesn't take anything away from the plot, but it develops Rocky into, yes, you, you, you like him. He's not a thug. He, he cares. He he's a well-meaning guy. Yeah. Um, and um, and and you really you feel such compassion for him because he tries to do a good a good good deed, a good thing, and it shows that he's got morals and ethics. Mm -hmm. And even if he yeah. is, you know, kind of a kind of a loser, so to speak, as he would call himself at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but but he tries to do a good thing, and then he gets rebuffed. Yeah. Um, you know, for trying to do <laughs> something nice. It makes you kind of feel even more compassion for him. Yeah, oh, oh absolutely. Yeah. It's a it's a key scene, I think, in the film, and I'm so glad that they kept it. I mean, the key scene, in my opinion, in that movie is that scene after he goes to wander around the uh the spectrum the night before the fight. Mm -hmm. And he comes back and he's sitting on the bed and yep. um Mm -hmm. And he says to Adrian, I can't do it. I can't beat him. Um, what he now, says. Rumor has it. I'm sorry to interrupt, Bill. Yeah. But rumor yeah. has it that they were trying to cut that as well. I've read that before. That they were trying. I to never heard that. Okay. I never heard that. They, I mean, it would have been very hard to cut that scene because yeah. what he says Three, is so vital, which is that mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if I win or lose. What matters is if I'm standing at yep. the end after 15 rounds. He That's says it doesn't matter if I get my head bashed in. Yep. But if I'm still standing after 15 rounds, I'll know I wasn't just some other bum from the neighborhood, I think, are the lines. It sums it all up right there. And there that, that is so such a key moment in the movie because he sets his own goals. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what Rocky does in all the sequels, you know? The goals are not ones that are set by people. At, he, he sets his own goals. Right. And that's so key to, uh, to us appreciating, you know, I also, we all relate to that, you know, that uh, that we must decide, we must decide what's important for us rather than uh, taking it from the outside world. Exactly. Um, We've said before is that the, all of the movies have such a life affirming the messages that are portrayed through them. You know, you can't walk out without just feeling the adrenaline in every cell of your body and just wanting to be a better person, to be you know, to try that much harder, to go yeah. a little bit further. Every right. one of those movies just, you know, they do it to you. Yep. You know, my father said in a uh, in an interview he did, he was asked about boxing because, of course, you know, he also produced Raging Bull mm -hmm. and all these boxing oh. films. And he said, he said, listen, I don't like Rage. I don't like uh, boxing. I'm not a boxing fan. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> well, here, here are a couple of... Uh, couple of frames from the opening of the film oh my god oh, wow. you know where these ones <laughs> that <I got>. that's <laughs> I awesome you see them in there that's but, when they yeah, yeah that's, when they're playing, awesome. playing the music. that's the slow motion opening yeah yeah wow you know, yeah he said you know he said he said i'm not i'm not a boxing fan i don't even like boxing my father said <laughs> he said but what i like is a good story and good characters yeah. and characters that you can feel for um and I, my father was a proponent. He, you know, it's always been that in Hollywood that films get made because uh, in, in many cases, just because they have big name actors in them. Mm -hmm. And so the financiers can feel more secure that they'll, right. that they'll make their money back because people want to see a movie with this big star, that big star. Sure. Right. And my father also, and I think it's part of why they in the end did push to get the movie done with Sly, who was an unknown, because uh, I think they recognized that he may be, not be a well-known guy, but he's a very talented actor. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and that in the end, in the end, people don't go to see movies for big stars. They go to see them for good stories. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. there's been plenty of times where I've gone because of the big star. It wasn't a great story. It wasn't a great movie. It was okay. But 
the story or the characters, they grab you, you're in. Yeah. You're in. You know. Yeah. yeah. When when That's you wound up doing uh Balboa 2006, was that almost like a uh I, I guess I could say a bucket list item of yours that you wanted to produce uh, a Rocky movie, you know, your dad and yourself. Can I tell you one more story about Rocky? Okay. You can tell me <laughs> yeah. as many stories go, about Rocky as you know, want. I don't know if anyone has told this story. I don't <laughs> yeah. know if anyone has told this story. There's on, no tape length on, on this, this Bill. I, just I, will get to, I will get to Balboa for sure. Um, have people talked about the, uh, the, the ice skating scene on this, on this podcast? About how there, there was no extras and that's how right. They did it. Yeah, that's right. yeah. So you know yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I always think that that's that that's another scene that really speaks to John Avildsen and his oh, brilliance, yeah. Yeah. and how, in a way, the fact that that they were under resourced in making the film forced them to be creative Absolutely. in the way that they did things. Um, and uh, and that the movie came out so much better for it. The wow. fact that they couldn't afford to pay extras um, meant that and that meant that they had to figure their way out into that ice skating rink. And Rocky had to pull a couple of <laughs> pull a little bit of a con job. And 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 yeah. the only reason was is because they couldn't afford all the extras. Right. Right. I think it worked out better. It worked out better. You know? Yeah. I thought it was well. The scene just, was more intimate. It wasn't, yeah, you know, so it wasn't people skating by and a lot yeah. of crowds. It was more intimate. It was, she was able to talk. He's, you know, it was definitely much better. Yeah. Without and crowd. it's unexpected. It's an right. un it's unexpected. It's not what you yeah. expect from the ice skating scene. And that brings us to Balboa because in Balboa, of course, he goes back to the ice skating rink. Um, and I think that this is the night that Robert Bruzio was there on the set. Okay. Uh, if I recall, maybe probably the first time I met Robert, um, that we shot, um, you know, we shot on an empty uh, kind of a, uh, just an empty in the middle of Philadelphia, this kind of empty lot. Uh -huh. And that was theoretically where the ice skating rink had been right. many years ago. And Rocky talks about how he met Adrian there and how much he misses her and what, you know, so uh no, producing producing uh, a Rocky movie was not on my bucket list. Um, uh, what I would say is I, I worked, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I've been so fortunate to have, you know, my father was, number one, such a wonderful man um, and a loving father and just, just a, you know, a good guy, um, just a gentleman. Um, so I was very fortunate to, to, to be born uh, his son. Um, but I started working on films early on on his films, Raging Bull being the first yeah. one that I worked on when I was 16. Um, and what happened really? Um, what did you do? On, on, on Raging Bull? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Raging Bull, I was a production assistant. Yeah, it was the yeah, first yeah. film I'd ever worked on. I, yeah. I lived, I was growing up in New York. Um, okay. It was the summer. Uh, we were shooting in, um, uh, in New York. And I had, I didn't know, I had no experience at all working on a film set. So I basically brought people coffee. Okay. Um, I would bring the film to the lab at the end of the day. Okay. Uh, there are all kinds of things, you know, there, like I was, it was actually on television recently and I flipped it on and there's a scene where, uh, uh, where they're in Detroit and they're in a hotel room. Um, and the fight has been delayed because of rain and, you know, uh, Jake LaMotta is stalking around the hotel room and he gets in a fight with his wife and with his brother. And he's he's all anxious and nervous before the fight because it's been delayed and he just wants to get out there and, and fight. And I don't know if you remember the scene, but there are his uh, there are two guys, the doctor and the, the manager, I guess, uh, uh, prepare uh, um, uh, practicing sewing up a. Uh, oh, a yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah, I, do remember that. I I I ran out and found the uh, the stitching uh, <laughs> of that scene. You know, okay. there was uh, we didn't have uh, any uh, of the um, you know the wire or the thread right. that they used. I remember I was watching that scene. I I, I went around, I went somewhere in New York to to find actual <laughs> stitching. Right. Oh, like, that's you know, awesome. So you, you end up doing all kinds of odd things, you know. That okay. um, and then what happened is 
uh, later, and I was I was at that point in high school. Um, uh, they were editing in New York, and um, uh, and so I would go to high school in the in during the day, and in the afternoon I would go to the um, to the editing room, and I was working in the editing room. It was the first editing room I worked on. I worked on several after that, um, and uh, Scorsese and Thelma Shoemaker were working out of Scorsese's apartment. But we had a separate editing room where we would keep, uh, you know, all the film and we would reconstitute it and have it prepared um, for for them to work at night. Um, so we would do that during the day and they they would work all night. Prepare, they did sort of a night shift. And um, and I remember that. Uh, uh, so I would I would um, back then we were working on film, of course, there was, nothing was digital. And um, and so one of the things I would do is I would go to Scorsese's apartment and I would bring him all the stuff they needed to work on that night. And then I would bring the stuff back, uh, the reels that they had worked on the night before, back to the editing room. And then I would reconstitute them. What that means is you would run them through a synchronizer and you would put fill. So you get movie footage that, you know, just old you know, movie footage that you would buy by the pound to keep all of the reels in sync. Um, because sometimes they would take sound and sometimes they would pay, take picture. At that point, the sound and the picture are separated into two. Oh, that's okay? right. That's so if they right. take some of the picture, then then it's, and they don't take the sound, then it's going to be out of sync and you have mm -hmm. to keep it in sync. So that right. if they want to work on it some more, it, okay. uh, it's in sync and they don't have to mess around with it. And one of the things I remember is that, um, uh, uh, that you know, we, we had a funny, uh, you know, a funny thing there that all of our, uh, all of the, uh, uh, the fill that we would get um, to fill was all uh, this old porno uh, movie. <laughs> <laughs> so on Friday nights, we would, uh, we would all, <laughs> and all the editors back then smoked like, chimneys yeah you know? and so they we'd all sit around in the in the <laughs> and then we'd, they'd we'd drink and we'd smoke and we'd watch the porno films <laughs> we had as well <laughs> so That's um, hilarious. and it was you know uh i mean it was I, I was so lucky because you know thelma shoemaker and sonia polanski the and and the people that worked there were, were always so kind to me and and anxious to teach me. And, and it, it was just the best afternoon job anyone could have. Um, it's amazing. I remember uh, Jake LaMotta would come to the editing room uh, oh, wow. on occasion. And we were under strict orders never to show him anything. Um, <laughs> never. And so he would be trying to look at stuff and we would be hiding it from him. And uh, <laughs> um, yeah. And uh and you know what a great first movie to to work on. I was oh, really Lord. lucky. I didn't know one movie from the other. I'd never of worked. Course. On it. Could I uh, ask uh, a question? Uh, no, sorry. No, no sorry, Rick. No questions. Is it my I, turn? Time's up, Rick. <laughs> okay. One of the more rocky stories. <laughs> I know. Go ahead. Well, it's, it's your just, show, man. <laughs> it's just, well, it's just since you're talking about the editing process. Yeah. You know, in in all the knowledge that you have about it. Um, one of, one of the questions that we had was, um, and we've discussed this on at many lengths before is when you're doing the movie and you edit and you cut out certain scenes because you, like you said earlier that they, you feel maybe they don't advance or whatever the case may be, but like on Balboa, for example, or Creed, Creed and Creed two, there were some deleted scenes on there in those movies that um tony and i and i have discussed like oh my god i can't believe that they were not actually in you know included in the movie how right. do you go about if that's your job or somebody else's job the process of saying no i don't think this is going to work or it's just going to make it too long you know in today's day and age of movies where they can go up to four hours long does it matter that much well you know i mean the film is almost always too long uh, on your first cut, okay. uh, it's it's I mean it's almost always the case that you're going to have to lose some things, and and it's it's painful to lose certain things, especially oh, yeah. especially your babies, you know, um, the wonderful scenes that but that they just as I said maybe they don't advance the plot, 
and you just have to, as they say, you know, kill your babies sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen it on occasions. Um, and it, it's, um, uh, uh, you know, I mean, uh, a lot of times what you do, I, not a lot of times, I mean, today, always what you do mm -hmm. is, you know, you, you get a cut of the film and then you show it to a small audience mm -hmm. and you ask them questions after and you get a sense of what they're understanding, yeah. what they're not, what do they're liking. Do they feel the film is too slow in places? Is it too, mm -hmm. does it move too fast in places? Are there areas where they, they, they feel it kind of loses momentum? Mm -hmm. um, so you, you, throughout the editing process, you do a lot of small screenings okay. and you get feedback from audiences. Now, of course, you know, as filmmakers, uh, you know, the director and the editors and also the producers are going to have some experience, hopefully, and they're going to have comments as well. And they're going to have beliefs of where they think things need to, mm -hmm. um, to be taken out. Okay. And sometimes even the things need to be put back in. It's a, it's, um, it's a process uh, of trying things, seeing if they work, and if they work, great. And if they don't, trying something different. Mm -hmm. um, the editing process, it's an incredibly creative process. Um, uh, and uh, and it's, it's, it's such a different experience than shooting the film. It's a very, very different process. Um, yeah. But, uh, and the film is, you know, it's really kind of s smoothed out in, okay. the, in the editing process. And that's where the film, of course, ultimately comes sure. together. Sure. Um, I, you know, one, one scene that I still, you know, still breaks my heart that was cut out um, was there was a, a scene in Creed II, um, a, a, a wonderful scene with Sly uh, giving a eulogy. Um, I was going to say that one. Or uh, uh, Spider Rico. Yeah. And I have to tell you, I remember talking to Sly after the scene, after we shot it. He was so brilliant in the scene. Yeah. So he was incredible. It was so moving. He was so brilliant. Um, and ultimately, the scene had to get cut out. The film, we just had running length issues. Mm -hmm. But it broke my heart that the scene got cut out. Um, and, and uh, you know, but I understood why. But even to this day, it still pains me that because it, it's yeah. just he was he was so great in the scene. I can't tell you. Like I, the, the, I wish that everybody could have seen it. Yeah, yeah, like the, the the fight with uh, Rocky and Drago in the hotel in the in the hospital lobby. Right. You know, I'm like, I'm that in Spider of Rico's eulogy. Yeah. And there were several others. I was just like, my my jaw hit the ground. I'm like, oh my god, I can't. Yeah. You know, it's. It's I painful. couldn't do that. I, mean, I couldn't do that. Sure, sure. I'm sure it's tough. It's painful, but in the end, you know, you have to sometimes, you know, as they say, you have to kill your babies for the for the for the for the benefit of the of the movie okay. as a whole. Right. Right. It's it, but... very very <laughs> difficult and painful decisions, yeah, especially for the be. director and the writers. Yeah. Um, who, who and, and the actors who sure put their heart and soul into those moments sure and 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 they want people to see them and so when they get cut out it's really but sometimes the you know you have to do it for the good of the of the of the, the film as a whole tony right. and i want to be a part of the panel that watches these movies <laughs> <laughs> going forward just saying just so you know you know if you didn't have a podcast we could consider it but you're going to come in you're going to come here and start blabbing about it so. never <laughs> now, let me tell you something. On a side note, I was an extra on Creed 2. Were you? And I was. I was. A um, couple of scenes where um, Adonis fought uh, Baby Drago, mm -hmm. Victor, uh, and was knocked down. And then he, Victor hit him on when he was on the ring, on the canvas. As part of that scene, I, I played Barkley Security. Uh-huh. And then... Uh, <laughs> so and in then, Philadelphia, uh, obviously. Oh, yeah. At uh, sunset, uh, that's that, that, that's that stage out there outside of Philly, right? Uh, sunset, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and then also at um, Adonis, uh, the, the walk up scenes, Victor and Adonis in Russia, I was right? Part of those. Ah, okay, me and my wife right. were there, amazing moments we'll never ever ever forget, and that's where I got to meet Sly. Uh huh, see now, see now Bill, Bill is immortalized in Rocky with his. Right, and he's got. To, you're immortalizing Creed too. We got to do something about that. 
And I know, you know Tony. Robert, I, Robert mentioned I got him, him and his daughter. Um, but unfortunately, that scene got cut out. Oh, jeez. <laughs> they came to Philly, and you know, Robert and I are good friends. And that's right. He told and, us. Uh, yeah. And I, I was really happy to get his daughter, and he, and you know, into that, in, into that, you know, as extras, and that. And unfortunately, it got it got cut out. Yeah. So, you know, speaking of which, I noticed you were showing those photographs during the introduction of uh, Sly and the Mountains. Uh, and yes. that's clearly from Rocky IV, of course. In the, yeah, it's right in here. Russia. This one? Russia. Yeah, yeah. That was actually in Jackson Hole. I was there. Uh, when oh, you shot were there? I was in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Yeah. And it was uh, it was gorgeous up there. And yeah, and this, I worked on, on Rocky IV. I worked as a location manager on Rocky IV. Okay. So, so you pretty much, I mean, you were involved in all the Rockies in some way. Not all of them. Not no. all of them. No, no. but you were. You, but I was you around for a lot of them. Rocky mm -hmm. Four was the first Rocky film I actually worked on. Okay. Um, but I will tell you a story. Uh, I was going to, to a boarding school in, in New Hope, Pennsylvania. <laughs> and they were, of course, uh, and my father was in Philly shooting Rocky Three, And, um, and I came for the weekend and, um, I came to Philadelphia to spend the weekend with him um, when they were shooting. And um, I get there kind of Friday evening and he says to me, we're going out to dinner. I said, okay, who are we going out to dinner with? <laughs> now, my father was very, very friendly with Burgess Meredith. Um, oh, they became, wow. they played Mickey. Um, Burgess and my father were, my father was, uh, was with Burgess maybe probably the day he passed away and they, they were great friends. They, they, mm -hmm. and Bur Burgess loved, loved uh, wine. He was a real wine connoisseur. Um, so anyway, he said to me, we're going out to dinner. This would have been Rocky three. Um, we're going out to dinner with Burgess and with Mr. T. Oh, what a combination. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, uh, Mr. T is one of the actors in the movie. Um, you're going to meet him. We're going down to the lobby now. We're going to meet him and we're going to walk to the restaurant. Um, and trust me, you won't forget him. <laughs> <laughs> and he told me a story about Mr. T, actually, I think before we met him, that um, that Mr. T's uh, real name is Lawrence. Um, but and he said he said to me that um, that that he, my father, was the only one who was allowed to call him Lawrence. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> and that the reason he made everybody call him Mr. T because when he was a boy growing up, um, his father, um, I think he was, a, I think he used to shine shoes, um, his father. And everybody used to refer to him as boy. They would say, hey, boy, dude, boy, clean my shoes, boy. And he said, when I, he said to himself, when I grow up, nobody's going to call me boy. Mm. And so that's okay. why he named himself Mr. T. Gotcha. Um, is, so, is T for his last name? Uh, you know, I don't know his last name, actually. I just know that his first name is Lawrence. I never really, I mean, I guess you can Google it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm presuming it is. But um, so we go, uh, we go out to dinner together um, and where uh, we start walking in Philadelphia was a tough town back then. Mm -hmm. And we decided to walk to the restaurant. We're going to a French restaurant. Um, and we walk through some of the, some of the, toughest neighborhoods in Philadelphia. And Mr. T looked just like he does in the movie. He had the <laughs> mohawk and the feathered Cheering. earring and he's built like a, you know, like a truck. Um, and, um, and it's these three white guys walking through these tough, dangerous neighborhoods in Philadelphia with Mr. T. And you never felt so safe yeah. in a, a bad neighborhood. You know that you were with right. Mr. T. Nobody was going to mess with you. No, right. And we went to uh, we went to this French restaurant, and I remember that uh, Burgess was ordering all of these great bottles of French wine and giving us all a lesson in in wine. The my father, Mr. T, and I a uh, lesson in in the the in fine French French yeah. wine. It was it was a wonderful evening, very yeah. very memorable. Awesome. Well, yeah. just to circle back on that, I can tell you that Tony and I would never say a word if we were to 
pre-watch these movies. <laughs> I'm still working on that, huh? I am. I am. I'm thinking about that. I am not right. giving it up. All right, let's see what we can do for Creed Four. <laughs> yeah, please. I'm all in. I'll sign a non-disclosure. We're good. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we, so have, yeah. Do you have any any stories from Rocky Two since we, since we skipped over you that? Know, one? I wasn't. I didn't work on Rocky Two. Um, the only thing I can tell you is that I remember. You know, I was just a kid. Um, I guess when they made Rocky II, I was, I don't know, 14 or something, 15, mm -hmm. maybe 14. And I, I remember that, um, that I was with my father and, uh, and I overheard him talking about Rocky II. And I said to him, you're going to make Rocky II? He said, well, we're talking about it. And I said to him, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thankfully, Don't this time it didn't listen Rocky to you. Rocky was perfect. It, everybody loved it. Which is true. Don't ruin it. <laughs> Just leave what's well enough alone. Yeah. Wow. You want an Oscar for it? You made good money on it. It's rem it will be remembered yeah. forever. Forever. Don't do it. Don't destroy it. I said to him. Thank God he didn't listen to me. I must say, yeah, that, that time, good thing he didn't. Is exactly yeah. right. And this was back when, before there was everything had a sequel all the time. That's right. Sequels were not so common back then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They were so, not yeah. so common back then. So but um, but obviously, you know, Rocky II turned out to be a wonderful film, and and, mm -hmm. and and I guess that was my fear. I guess my fear was that it would all get destroyed uh, if they didn't make a good movie. But sure. fortunately, they made me Rocky. Well, you know, well, let's face it, a lot of sequels Rocky never. Too. A lot of sequels never, yeah, right. ever, you know. Yes. Yeah. But well, I, I know there are a lot of people who, who like it, Rocky too, as much, and some even more. I, I believe that Ryan Coogler told me that that was his favorite Rocky. Okay. You know, it's funny. Yeah. I, I, I do remember reading that. He used to watch that one with his dad. I think, I yeah. think that, yeah, Ryan told me that that was his favorite, his favorite mm -hmm. Rocky movie, mm -hmm. which I thought was, um, was, was <clears throat> interesting. It's funny because Rocky used to be my favorite above all of them. I'm, I'm older than most of the people. When we talk about them, we bring them on the show. I was 10 when Rocky came out. And when Balboa came out, I was 40 years old. And I had a lot going on in my life. So the older I get, the more I relate to and understand Balboa more. Absolutely. Than the well, others. Yeah, I mean, the thing with Balboa was that, you know, uh, Rocky V had been, you know, had, had not been a success. Mm -hmm. um, and it was critically panned. It was the first of the Rocky films that really didn't enjoy financial or critical success. Mm -hmm. And I think that it really ate at Sly. Yeah. Um, that the, that it would, that, that, that it, that it would. <clears throat> but one of the things I remember is that when we started working on the film and announced that we were doing it, um, all of the talk shows, uh, you know, and then late night hosts, you know, they say, ah, oh, they have announced that you're doing Rocky Balboa. What's uh, what's Rocky going to fight this time? Alzheimer's disease? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. There were, there were all kinds of Are they uh, fighting in wheelchairs. People were making fun of us. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but they they didn't know who they were dealing with. They didn't know they were dealing with Sly, who, right. uh, who, you know, is, you know, an incredible workaholic. I don't know if, I mean, I'm sure everybody has told you his work ethic is yeah. second to none, really. Two of the best movie speeches, in my opinion, ever came out of that movie. That's right. One in front of the boxing commission and one on the street corner. One with his son. Yeah. Boom. One of the things to look for in the scene with his son is that I remember we were, we were, um, it was a, you know, we shot so many of these movies all night in the winter in Philadelphia, it was not easy. We, a lot of these movies had a lot of night scenes and we would shoot all night in, you know, it would be 15 degrees out and snowing. And I remember that night uh, we had a lot of problems because it was snowing when we shot one side mm -hmm. looking one way. Uh, and then when we turned around to shoot the other side, it so other side it stopped snowing, <laughs> and it was really havoc. Um, and it, but you know what a great scene it turned out to be. Yeah. yeah. Um, and of course, uh, I think working to our benefit was that people's expectations after Rocky Five were not so high. 
mm -hmm. know? And so when we actually delivered, you know, an exciting, moving, uh, well put together, wonderfully written and directed movie by Sly and, uh, and wonderfully acted um, by, you know, all these wonderful cast members. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, people, people went in with low expectation and, uh, and that's, and they got something very different than what they expected. Well, and, and considering it was 16 years later, you also exactly. got a lot of new people that really maybe even didn't know Rocky, didn't know right. the failure of Rocky five. Right. So, and it, it's, it, it, it's a good testament to how a good story and a good character can mm -hmm. make you love the movie. Once again, mm -hmm. once again, and that character of Rocky is so infectious, uh, whether he be 30 or 60 or 70. Uh, there's something about that character that, you know, and, and, you know, it's amazing to see Sly, he just falls right into it, you know? He, sorry. Just, I'm sorry. Just, no, no worries. <laughs> he just falls right into it and he just knows how that people respond to that. Sure. And, and of course, I want him. Of course, mention you know Burt Young and Carl Weathers, um, oh, yeah. who we lost lost both of them recently, and and uh, Burt was like family to me. Um, uh, my father, he, my father, and he really loved each other. And Burt was such a kind man um, and such an interesting guy. And I, uh, as Robert talked about him on the podcast you did with him, he was just uh, such a a joy to be around. Mm -hmm. Such a lovely, warm, you know, and and I didn't know Carl quite as well, but but I saw him on many occasions, and he was mm -hmm. always very warm and kind um, and pleasant. He was just a always was always a very nice. It's really uh, sad for us to have lost both of them recently. Absolutely, and, um, it was only yeah. months apart too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it really, it, yeah. We're it, it, we're. I mean, it's really very, really heartbreaking for us because all of these people all became, you know, it's kind of like a big family. So sure. Well, sure. When yeah. you're working with four movies with one actor or three movies with this actor, six with that actor, I mean, Bert was in yeah. all of them up to Balboa. I mean, right. so, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it does become, yeah. I mean, they all get together and, and do it again. Uh, yeah. it's gotta be hard for them to, I mean, you guys, I'm sure you probably saw it. Sly went on social media after Carl Weathers died and he was visibly choking, choked yeah. up. And it's tough. Yeah. It's tough. I mean, we feel that as fans and we don't yeah. even know them. Right. Could imagine they, were, know they were having a hard time finding that uh, an actor to play that part. Uh, um, and I remember my father told me that uh, they, they couldn't find the right guy to play Apollo Creed. And they were doing a casting session one day and, and Carl walked in there. And apparently he just had a couple of minutes. He had to catch a flight back to uh, back to the Bay Area, and they wouldn't let him leave. They said, "No, you're not going." <laughs> you know, and um, you know because finally, I think they felt the minute they saw him and the minute he he yeah. was reading, they found their guy. Um, when you, you were know? talking about the popularity of, you know, Rocky, whether age thirty or sixty. Were you on set on, on Balboa when they were at, at the Italian market? I was I on understand. set every day. <laughs> okay, so there, there's truth in that. In that, uh, where they weren't yelling Sly, they were no, no, no. Yelling, they're yelling Rocky. Listen, they, I'm telling you, it's amazing being with Sly in Philadelphia. <laughs> I remember we would fly in for uh, to do. This is before we were shooting the movie, just to do some some location scouting. Okay. We would fly in and we would walk through, you know, these neighborhoods in Philadelphia. We probably should have had more security with us. Um, <laughs> no, really. And people do not yell, hey, Sly. No. In Philadelphia. When they see him, that's exactly right. They yell, Rocky, Rocky, it's right. Hey, Rocky's here. You know, and people, yeah. Rocky's here. You know, it's, they, they relate to him. Completely. I mean, at least the people on so many of the people on the street and there were times where, you know, all of a sudden we'd have, you know, 10 people, then 20 people, then 50 people surrounding us. Yeah. You know, and it was kind of incredible how relaxed Sly was about it. Well, um, it's, talking, it is, it is um, crazy. It is crazy. 
them. I was a little, I was like, wait, this is not, this may not be good. I mean, <laughs> we're in some of these terrible neighborhoods, Kensington in, in Philadelphia. Yeah. Yeah. And all of a sudden we're surrounded by 50 people, you know, at, uh, at 11 o'clock at night. Yeah. Uh, but he, um, but he, they, they love him and he loves them. And so. Yep. Cause I had read at the Italian out. market during that filming that you guys had to like move that along expeditiously yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because it was getting out of control. They, they, they come from every <laughs> nook and cranny to see Rocky. And By you know, I mean, it's Tony, we would have been there. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, I mean, it's incredible. It's incredible. The, the, the connection that this character in that city have is yeah. just, uh, it, it's something totally unique. Um, Agreed. Agreed. And, and you know, the funny part about that, what you just said, is that I don't think it would have worked with any other city. And I, I mean, I'm not from Philadelphia. I'm originally from New York City. I don't think it would have worked in New York City. I don't think it would have worked in Chicago, Boston. Any, for some reason, the city is much of a character of that film as Rocky or Adrian or anybody else. You know, I think one of the reasons they shot the original film there, I don't remember this exactly, but I think it had something to do with the fact that there wasn't a union there um, or there weren't many union members there. Okay. Uh, and and shooting the film on such a low budget would have been impossible working completely union. And that they like you could never have done it in New York. Um, that was such right. a union town. Right. Um, but I, I, I don't know the exact story behind it, but I believe it had something to do with the fact that the union, the, the film union there, IATSE was not quite as strong and they could, they could get away with a lot of stuff that they maybe wouldn't have otherwise, if I'm not mistaken. Um, no, that I, sounds about right because I remember great. hearing stories yeah. about them jumping out of vans and filming a scene in 25 minutes and jumping back in a van and yeah, you know, yeah. there's no, you know, late, nobody's right. around. And it so yeah, that might've been shot on the fly. That John. Been. John Avildsen, you know, what can you say about him? I mean, he was, uh, what a brilliant man he was. Oh, um, Lord. And as Robert told you, he almost did uh, the film that Ro Robert and I were working yeah. on together. Yeah. And we, it's it's really unfortunate that he didn't, um, although we ended up with a wonderful director, but, um, and so we were lucky, but, uh, but the plan was to do it with John. Yeah, that's how this whole started, actually, with our introduction to you. He said, you know, he had yourself and he had John, the director, and Bert was going to be in the film. And, right. my, you know, my Lord, I mean, it, you know, it's got success written all over it right there. So, Well, it was, Bert, it was Bert that actually, I mean, I'm not, I don't remember exactly how Robert presented it on the podcast. And I'm not sure it was exactly the way I remember it. My recollection is that Bert introduced me to Robert okay. and gave me Robert's script and told me to read it. Um that's that's my recollection that 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 it was the that Bert was the uh, the connection between us. And um, again, well written characters, characters you care about, characters you want to see succeed. And you know, and so Robert and I are both Yankee, big Yankee fans. So okay. that was that was also part of our bonding process. So. Okay. Well, I still I'm, like you. I still like you guys anyway. I'm a Mets fan. Now, but that's right. <laughs> You're what? I'm a Mets fan. Uh, well, we won't go there. <laughs> that's that's a different podcast. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Trust me, growing up was rough. <laughs> Majority of my neighborhood was was met, was Yankee fans. So, well, but, you know, my yeah. father grew up in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly enough, um, near Gun Hill Road, but he was not a Yankee fan. He was a Dodger fan. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, and the reason he was a Dodger fan, typically. And I think this says a lot about why Rocky got made, is that he loved underdogs. There you go. Yeah. He and the, the Dodgers were were always underdogs and they were oh, always yeah. the bums. That's the funny bums. that you say that because my the reason why we're Mets fans, my father and I, because my grandfather followed the Dodgers. Right. And when they left New York and went to uh LA, he was not gonna follow the Yankees. Right. So we're not following <laughs> the Yankees. And then when the Mets came in town, he started following the Mets. And the right. same thing. He's like, well, it takes more courage and more guts to follow a team like this. Yeah, I always admire Cubs fans, for example. Yeah, but exactly. Exactly. I'm not, sure. I'm not sure I'm that much of a masochist, but. Yeah. <laughs> you be, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. 
it's but, so funny. But that was, um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that that was, again, part of, at least for my father, his attraction to Rocky, that it was about yeah. an underdog. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that was part of, part of his character. He would always root, if you were watching a sport of, sporting event with him, he right. would always root for the team that was expected to lose. Right, right. Yeah, always. That was well, you just know what they say. Everybody loves an underdog. You know? yeah, absolutely. Huh? They say everybody loves an underdog. Yeah, that was like to really see. his nature. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. In fact, I have here, speaking of, here, let me get it for you. Um, this belonged to my father. And this, uh, and of course, it's funny that he would have purchased this. This oh, is wow. a, uh, an autographed copy of picture of the shot heard around the world. Oh uh, my God. You see uh, Jackie Robinson here. Yeah. Uh, Bobby Thompson at home plate. Um, so it's funny that my father would buy a picture of one of the worst moments in Dodger history <laughs> <laughs> and, and put it on his wall. <laughs> That's hysterical. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. so that's great. and it's a uh, it's 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 uh, autographed by uh, Ralph Branca and Bobby Thompson. Oh, oh both of them! Wow. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So very nice. Yeah. Nice piece of baseball memorabilia right there. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Um, well, Bill, we couldn't be happier than having yeah, you. How on. many of your questions did you get through? I think you you, you, you two. One. <laughs> two. No, I think we, I actually think we hit. You know what? It, see, when when you guys come on and you start talking like you're doing. You wind up hitting our questions without us even asking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it actually works out. I yeah. mean, because you answer that question. I mean, I talked to you about growing up around the Rocky business, the PA on Raging Bull. Actually, there's only one question uh, uh, you didn't touch base on, if you wouldn't mind. I, I wrote, how do you differentiate from producing a movie that you'd like versus you think the audience would like? I mean, is there a difference? Or do you just say, I, I'm going to produce a movie that I know I'm going to love and – if the audience likes it, that's great. Or do you intentionally do things because you know the audience will like it? I, I think I think the only way to live is to follow your heart. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, I, when I, I was in film school, I went to uh, first to NYU film school and then to the American Film Institute. Oh, wow. And I remember, uh, I don't remember who it was, but we'd have a lot of wonderful directors that would come by AFI. Um, and I remember one of them said something that, that really stuck with me. And he said, uh, paint the picture and then worry about selling it. Um, there you go. And, uh, you know, I, I think different people do things different ways, but I think that if you can't trust your gut and you, when it comes to creative right. things, I mean, again, I, I go back to Sly, uh, you know, I mean, Sly has this instinctual understanding of what people will respond to. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I will always trust him above above everything when it comes to these kind of things he just knows but you know right. you also you also have to know what you think and what you believe and what right. feels like is a movie that you would want to see right. um, it doesn't always turn out the way you want it to unfortunately mm -hmm. movies have so many moving parts and they all have to move correctly for the movie to come out like a rocky for example mm -hmm. and so often that doesn't happen so yeah. many Films that don't turn out well started off with very good intentions. And really, the people wanted the movies. Obviously, they wanted them to be great movies. Right. Um, but certain things happen through the process of writing them or shooting them or editing them where it might have just kind of gone somewhat off course. A different way. Right. Um, right. Occasionally, no, that makes sense. occasionally, everything goes well. But no, I'm not. I personally am not. Uh, making it just because I want the audience to enjoy it. I want to make something that I feel is going to be a great movie. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm hoping that the, that what interests me and what, you know, uh, that the audience will also respond to you. Yeah, who, who's, who else are you going to follow? Right. You know, so right. that's, that's my response to the question. Rick, did you have any question that he didn't you know, answer? I think I had, uh, <laughs> one one real quick one was yeah, yeah. do you have any um memorabilia from the original Rocky movie or something from your dad that you have held up? Maybe his I have I have stuff. I'm not sure I have it here. Oh, um, no, I have cool. A lot of uh look, I had I don't know where it went. <laughs> but when I was a kid, I don't know if you remember, there's a, a poster in Rocky One 
of Apollo Creed standing there. Yes. It says bicentennial. It's in the movie. And oh, I don't yeah. know how I ended up with it, up with it, but I had it when I was a kid in New oh, York. Wow. I don't know where it is. Oh, um, wow. yeah. I don't know where that is, that poster. Um, but obviously I've got all the posters. Um, I've got a ton of buttons and things like that. Here Ooh. I have, let's see, here's a Rocky Four cup. Um, okay. Oh, awesome. <laughs> you know, that's great. That, uh, uh, that they had made. I've got, uh, I've got my, one of my, one of the things I like the most, I don't have it here, but is my crew gift from Raging Bull. Um, we got these, uh, and uh, we've got these beautiful uh, uh, little sterling silver boxing gloves. Oh my God. And uh, very small, like about that big, sterling yeah. silver. And on one of it, it would say to your name. And then the other, on the other one, it said, thanks, Bob and Marty. Um, oh, wow. And I still have that. Um, that's great. Uh, somewhere. And that's one of, one of my, one of the things that I, I'm most proud to have and most happy yeah. to have, let's say. Um, I got a ton of buttons. I, I started, um, for example, I think both on Creed One and Creed Two. I think when when we were shooting Creed Two, I gave uh, Ryan um, a uh, a Rocky Two button. Um, no they had all these oh, buttons. Did. Yeah, these little yeah, very one nice. Said the contender and one yeah champion. Yeah, and they're original. What's well, these little buttons from the movie? Um, yeah. So I gave. Uh, Ryan a Creed 2 button and I think I gave Stephen Capel a Creed 4 button. So I have a bunch of these buttons from okay. the original Rocky movies that they would oh, have wow. made for each I, movie. I gotta tell you, I, I still here. here's still my uh, introduction from let's Creed. See, here is my, I was wearing this this morning. Here's my Creed uh, I don't know if you can see it, my Creed uh, yeah. crew jacket. Oh yeah. Creed 1 um you know, there's a. I have a. I have an amazing uh, jacket, uh, very seventies or eighties, I guess, uh, from Rocky Four. It was kind of one of those silk bomber jackets. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And on the back, it's got a big patch that's. It's got the uh, the the Creed Four logo in it of the the U.S. and the and the uh, Russian flag. Russian flag. Okay. Oh, yeah. awesome. So okay. I got one of those uh, somewhere lying around. Um, okay. In some closet somewhere. So I, yeah, there's stuff, a lot of stuff lying around. <laughs> Very that's, cool. That's so awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, I was saying under my breath that the uh, on the on Creed, the original um, uh, opening when it comes into what was his name, and it goes to that music, and you know that's Creed. just like it just hits you. It's like bam, you yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, love yeah. it. I remember, I mean, the first time we saw that with the music was in the studio when we were recording the music. And man, when you saw that with the music, you were like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is going to really hit home with the audience. It resonates for yeah. sure. Definite impact. Definite impact. Yeah. yeah. It yeah. hit the it was, really, really, and it was a lot of fun to see that for the first time. Yeah. Very cool. I mean, we could talk forever, Tony. I know. Really. That's why we I could said, build the music. It says in audio tape in the old days where we're going to run out of time. So I know. we have to stop it eventually. <laughs> I know, but, but we couldn't thank you enough for coming oh on. Well, enough. maybe we can do it again sometime. Let's absolutely. Let's I mean, we would be loving right. to hear. You all know, the we might be enjoying now. it, but the audience might be bored out of their minds at this point. Well, so. Rick and I are. We're painting it. the picture. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we do this. We're not making millions. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, they can just turn it off. So exactly. Yeah. What no, did you say yeah. about painting the picture? Right? That's, right. that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. No, really. We thank you so much, and we would oh love God. to have you on again. We love hearing the Rocky stories in the old days, or Creed stories, or future stories. So it's been a lot of fun. Would you it's come been back? A lot of fun. I watched some of your podcasts. I didn't. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I didn't know that it existed until Robert told me. Understood. No, but understood. I, I do no social media. None of you know. Yeah. I but I was I was unaware of it, so I did put on some of the podcasts and looked at them before. And I, and I just think it's so wonderful that this podcast exists. I was Thank surprised, uh, pleasantly surprised. So happy to know that it does exist. So happy to know that there are people out there who are so interested in, in these movies and, and all the other things around these movies that you guys Absolutely. talk about. 
and uh, and it was it's really been wonderful sitting with the two of you, and and I'm I'm really honored that you asked me to come on. So thank well, you. Well, formulate thank you. all your thoughts because we're going to have you back on, so you can tell more Great. stories. Yeah, exactly. sounds good. Sounds Thanks good. Thanks again, like Bill. Thank, thank you so much. Sure. We really appreciate it. All right, guys, a real pleasure. Real pleasure talking to you. Take thank care. You. We'll okay. see you. Well, see, now that was just, <laughs> that was worth the wait, wasn't it? <laughs> oh my God, Tony, that's like freaking. <laughs> wow. uh, I, was, I was looking forward to that so much, and I'm so glad he had as much fun as we did. Uh, what yeah. a pleasure to talk to! My goodness, what yeah. a pleasure! Love the stories, so, keep them coming. You know? I know, and he's like, "Can I can I tell another Rocky story?" I mean, it's like you know, what, what do you mean? Can yeah, absolutely, please, my oh, man. Let me go grab a pillow and a blanket, and talk <laughs> away. <laughs> That's what I was like, you know, there's no time limit here. This thing will just keep no. recording. Let's go. So, this is one of right. this is our longest one to date. It is. I know. I know it is. And that's okay. And I would have kept going. So Yeah. I, <laughs> I didn't, sure. I didn't sure want to do. keep them all night, but at the same time, like I said, let's have him back. So oh, absolutely. More, you know? Absolutely. So thank you again, everybody, for watching. We appreciate all the support. Um, this one's a good one. So if yeah. you miss it, go back and watch it. But otherwise, we'll see everybody next week. You got it. All right, buddy. I'll talk to you. Yep. Yeah.